If you were a classroom teacher in the UK, in a school that had now abandoned the creative options for your students selected for their forthcoming GCSE, GCSE year to focus on the EBAC, what would you do now? Who would like to take that? Kerry. Yeah, thanks. So my school has already abandoned this, has it? Yes. The, the question is, is that in a school that has now abandoned the creative options uh, selected in exchange for the EBAC, and I have to still keep working at the school, do I? Yes. Okay. Because I'd actually say that um, quite a lot of what the previous presentation and a lot of the um, current education policy is making me think is that, we, that there is space for alternative models of education and learning that are growing outside the school setting and that we're actually starting to see a lot of very radical and very interesting educational models. We're looking at things like the really free school, where people are setting up their own educational exchanges. We're starting to see the rise of things like the School of Everything, where people are finding teachers who can help them work on what's going on. So there's a little bit of me that is interested in the position that we can take as educators to create a platform for self-learning, to create a platform for people to come together and work together and learn together. And I think... <coughs> You know, we can keep working within the system and tinkering around the edges, or we can start saying what are the alternative educational models that are developing and start figuring out how to foster those. So I would say start by figuring out what's, how you can use your platforms and your power, because educators do have power still, <coughs> you need to remember that we do, to create new platforms that allow people to learn together without, frankly, having to give a damn. Me. <laughs> um, Graham sent me an email and it said, would you like to come, Ken's in, Ken's in England, would you like to join us one evening for a conversation? He didn't tell me that there would be 400 others here and uh, that he'd ask questions like this. Um, if I were working in a school where they'd abandoned the options to go for the EBAC, um, what would I do now? First I'd cry. I think it was desperately sad. And uh, then I'd start having arguments. And I'd be a professional arguing about the future for our children. I'd be a professional arguing about what it is we're supposed to be doing as a school. If I were in one of the subjects that are in the EBAC, which is only a measure of schools, it's not a qualification for children, I'd be saying, how do I link with you in the subjects that are not in it so that we can join forces to have a powerful argument? I would sign up immediately to the website called A Better Back, and I would go around encouraging everybody I met to sign up to that website. Look for it, a better back. <laughs> Look for it, I'm serious, because most of you will go out after this and not take action, you simply moan about it. And if we're a profession that's going to do things, then we've got to have a voice, and it means we've got to have an argument. And uh, that's what I'd do. That would use the kennel. Well, um, a couple of things. I, I think it's important that we, uh, we take care with language here. So I don't think myself that we should accept the idea of academic subjects and creative options. Uh, the fact is there aren't any academic subjects and there aren't any creative subjects. There are academic ways of doing everything. Uh, you know, I mean, history is not an academic subject. That, Academic work is a, is a, a form of work. It's, it's a way of, it, it's really a synonym for a certain type of propositional idea and for a certain sort of, a form of critical reasoning. And you can do that about anything. You can do it about genes, you can do it about uh, historical periods, you can do it about cooking. You can be academic about anything. And I'm not against it, by the way. I mean, I worked in universities. Academic work's very interesting. Um, and it can be very creative. The truth is, you can be creative in anything. This is one of the problems I remember we had when we were doing All Our Futures, the report we did 10 years ago, talking to some members of the then government. And I'm always very keen to say this. I was saying it this afternoon with Mick and a different group. I don't think this is a party political argument. Actually, it, neither party, or all three if we count them, uh, I think has a particular purchase on this idea of a more creative approach to education. They certainly don't in America. The Republicans and Democrats are just as bad as each other. Uh, and I think it's very important not to make it a party political argument. It's a political argument, but it's not a party political one in which one party, I think, has it right. Uh, the report I and others worked on called All Our Futures, Creativity, Culture and Education, which we published 10 years ago, 
was developed for the Labour Party, or the Labour government, I should say. And what we're arguing there is that creativity is something that's possible in everything that you do. There are misconceptions about creativity. People think it's about special people. It's not. We're all creative. We all have creative possibilities. Or they think it's about special things, like the arts. Well, the arts are vital. I'm, I'm, a, you know, an, I'm a flagging advocate for the arts and schools, but not because they're the creative bit of education. You can be creative at science and maths, and you should be. The arts have other reasons. Uh, there are other purposes, the arts. They're not the creative enclave of the curriculum. They shouldn't be, anyway. Um, and people think you can't do anything about it. Naturally, you can teach anybody to be more creative. You can, it's susceptible to pedagogy, as long as you understand the nature of it. So, no matter what remains in the curriculum, uh, in the, the EBAC bit of the curriculum, there are opportunities for all teachers to be more creative in the work they do and to encourage creativity among their students. And I think Kerry's absolutely right, and, and Mick's right in what he's saying, is that, is that I think that schools have more power here than they believe. Sometimes we live in constraints that we've imposed on ourselves. You know, it doesn't say anywhere at the moment, let's hope it never does, that you have to spend 40 minute, you have to organize them into 40 minute periods, or that you have to do the same thing every Tuesday. Head teachers have much more freedom over the school than some head teachers seem to believe. And when the door closes anywhere in your classroom, you are the education system so far as those kids are concerned, and you have much more freedom there than we often suppose. So I think we do have to create room in this system. We also have to work with politicians and, uh, and press the case for a better framework. But in the meantime, we can't wait for people at Westminster to get it. You know, kids can't put their education on hold while people figure this out. You know, we have to get on and do the best we can with this framework and agitate for a new one. It's interesting that you make the diff distinction between um, being party political and being political. Yeah. Um, it, 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 we were running a, a National Curriculum Review meeting in London just uh, the other week, and something that came out actually from both sides really is that education and schooling seems to become a political football each time there's a new party. Would you care to comment on that? What, you know, I mean, that, can that, is that sustainable? Every time the, a new party comes to power, it suddenly gets knocked around again, reformed, it's just always happened. You know, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I don't know about making them carry, but I, mean, I, I get more phlegmatic about this. Uh, you know, they, they come and they go, honestly. They do. <laughs> the good news is this too will pass. And <laughs> it will, it will, and the real action in education happens on the ground. You know, people getting on and doing what they believe to be the right thing, and, and people do differ. The good news in, in this current legislation is that there's a lot more room in it. I mean, when the Education Act came in in 1988, they tried to uh, specify almost everything. What tends to happen is, I think, governments go into command and control mode. And they, they think, we've got to sort this thing out and, and do it immediately. And, and, uh, and there is an ideology that comes in. I mean, for example, speaking to you know, one of the ministers this morning, you know, there is this current view, that, uh, and, it, and it tends to be more typical uh, in the Conservative Party, that we have to get back to these real subjects and teach academic subjects, and, and people have to learn information. Well, they do. I mean, what I keep trying to argue is that we, we mustn't uh, surrender to inappropriate forms of conversation. That nobody's arguing for a moment, at least I'm not, I don't think anybody is, that a more creative approach to education is at odds with raising standards or with learning information. Of course it's not. You can't be creative unless you're in control of what you're doing, unless you know stuff and you get better and better at things. You can't, you know, I, I can't play the piano. I've, a whole list of other things I keep telling you I can't do. Uh, but, and I can't be creative on the piano uh, because I can't control it. I mean, I can be expressive to a degree. I can bang out some notes that make me feel better. But I might as well throw rocks at the wall. You know, I'd feel better doing that. To be creative means to be progressively more, or, or if, if your creative abilities are to develop, you have to get progressively better at the materials that you're using. And that's true whether it's mathematics or it's, it's ceramics. So I remember when I was doing the report in the early 80s, in, in, in the late 90s, uh, we had a great group of people on this advisory committee. Um, I remember one of the members of the then government saying to me, that, you know, the problem with creativity is you can't define it. And I said, no, I think the problem is you can't. You know, and, <laughs> and fortunately we can, and, and here it is. So, 
you know, we mustn't surrender to inappropriate terms of conversation. If the language isn't right, we should propose language that's better. Because it's actually in the language that we can lose the argument. If we start to agree with people that are academic subjects and creative subjects, we've already conceded the ground that we ought to be occupying. Good point, good point. OK, if we could just bring the house lights up just a little bit, that would be good. And we've got some roving mics, I believe, if the roving mic people could show you where they are. Do we have roving mic people? Mm, I can't see any roving mic people. Hmm. Well, this will be, this will, this will be fun. Um, hello, roving mic people. Okay, we're going to get a roving mic person. We seem to have a slight communication problem there. How far did you say they could rove, Graham? Um, I think they've roved. I, I, I think I, I think they've, they've possibly I, I think they've possibly roved um, to 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 the bar uh, next door or the hotel. While while we're waiting for the roving mic people, I do apologise uh, for, for the lack of roving mics or, or the distance of the roving mic. Um, another question then that's been 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 sent to me via Twitter earlier this evening while you were talking um, about sh how children should be organised, I guess how schools should be organised. Um, and the, the question, as I'll read it as it was, was should children be organised by stage and not age? Is it me? All right. <laughs> well, we are obsessed with this age thing and we are obsessed with the speed at which people learn. Uh, through the range of ages. At the moment a baby's born, we start comparing one with another. What did yours weigh? What did ours weigh? Was it early? Was it late? When did its first teeth come? When did it smile? When did it walk? We've got this sort of notion that if they don't keep up early on, they'll be in trouble. And I was talking to Ken earlier today about, I've got, I've got a friend who's 80 and he bounces into rooms and people say, you're doing well, aren't you? <laughs> And they say, well, what do you mean? And they say, well, you're doing ever so well for 80. And what they really mean is, you're not dead yet. Because uh, <laughs> most are, like, when they get to 80. And, and he reads very easily, he can see, and he can hear, and he, he does a bit of dancing, and they keep saying, you're doing well, aren't you? Because you're so far behind your cohort. <laughs> and then I, meet, I met the other day a grandmother who was incredibly worried because her granddaughter's parents, her, her own children, had been told that the granddaughter has really significant problems with sounds. Her phonic pickup isn't good enough. And therefore she will probably need extra help and we should be worried about it. So the daughter had told the grandmother that they were worried about this and what do they do? Because they're new parents and they're only four years into this job and it's suddenly become really hard. And Florence, the granddaughter, has problems because she's behind everybody else in her cohort. So grandmother wrote a letter saying, dear teacher, Florence can whisper, Florence can sing, Florence can shout, Florence doesn't have a problem with sounds. <laughs> and I think there is a real challenge for us in this thing about age and where it's going. At what age does it suddenly become good to be behind your cohort instead of in front of it? No, I, I think it's really, I'm getting to the point where I'm desperate to be behind. <laughs> when I was young, they were all going away from me. Now it's all right, it was fine. I had grey hair at 16. People used to say, God, you know, problem, you know, unusual. So there's a whole obsession with age in England. And uh, we, we sort of, if it's not age, it has to be stage. What about interest as a way of organising? What about enthusiasm? What about depth of learning? What about unleashing learning so that children can do things for an extended time? What about organizing so some aspects are messy and some are clean and some are thoughtful in the sense of deep and profound thought? And we just live in this old, old way of organizing schools <laughs> that we don't just stop and question, wonder about. And I don't think it's one or the other. I think we end up polarising every argument. Skills or knowledge, subjects or not, creative or well, whatever goes opposite to that. And one of the things politicians always do is put two things as though they're opposite when they're not quite. 
So we fall into the trap of arguing about it. So somebody has to make a decision. Age, not stage? Oh, I don't mind. No answer, is it? But it makes you think. <laughs> I bet a lot of you are hoping you're behind the cohort when you go out tonight, aren't you? <laughs> go on. Kerry. Well, what strikes me when we look at the next 10 to 20 years is a question of the demographic change that we're going to be facing. When we start looking at the likely makeup of this country, for example, we're looking at 50% of us aged over 50, 25% aged over 65. So the whole organisation of education is something that happens in a little box and it's done to children. And adults are understood as teachers and kids are understood as learners seems entirely insane to me when we think about how we're going to tackle the, the massive, massive challenges that we're facing over the next 10, 20 years. We need to figure out how to bring together the skills of the different age cohorts across all of our population and figure out how we organise education around that, which means that we need to tackle in this country the really challenging question of how do we let adults who aren't professionals and aren't parents talk to children? We need to figure out how we create a conversation that is public that involves adults from all sorts of backgrounds without CRB checks coming and working with young people and talking with them. And we need to figure out how we can recognise young people's capacity to act as educators and teachers. So I don't think it's age and stage, frankly, I think is still a tinkering around the edges conversation about what we do in these little boxes that were called schools. When we look at some of the serious challenges we're up against in the next 20, 10 to 20 years, we need to ask questions about our assumption that education should be organised as something that is just done to children anyway, full stop. Ken, would you like to pick up on that? No. There you go. Yes, yes I, would. <laughs> I will. No, I will. I will. I, I just want to pick up on, on this last point particularly. I've been doing a lot of work latterly in Oklahoma. Um, have I just suddenly got very large on that screen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's extreme close-up. Eh? If I'd known it was high def, I'd have shaved before I came out. <laughs> now, I've been, the state of Oklahoma. Uh, I've been helping them with a statewide strategy for creativity. And uh, I just came across a great example of, of, of what you're talking about. There's, um, they have a great reading scheme in Oklahoma, an early years program. And it features in uh, one school in Tulsa. It's in the Jinx School District of Tulsa has a relationship with another institution which is across the street. And the, the other institution approached the school district and said, we've heard about this reading scheme, can we be part of it? And they said that, that would be fantastic. So they, the other institution is a retirement home. It's called the Grace Living Center. And what's happened is that they have established a school, a, a classroom in the foyer of the retirement home for these uh, sort of three and four-year-olds. The thing is, they don't go to the, the retirement home occasionally. This is where they go to school. The classroom is there, and they go there every day. And it's in the foyer, well, they create it in the foyer, and so the members of the retirement home have to go through the foyer every day to go to the restaurant. So they go past this class. Well, what happened, which is what they hoped would happen, was that early on in the scheme, it's been going for about five years now, Members of the retirement home were stopping to watch what, what was going on and, and they said to the teachers, what, what's happening here? And they said, well, we're, 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 it's a reading class, we're teaching these children to read. And, and one by one they said, well, would you like some help? And they said, that would be great. So they established, they call it the, the Reading Buddies program. And in this program, members of the retirement home sit one on one with the children and listen to them read and they read to them. That's it. Well, what's happened is, as a consequence, is that I think it's 70% of the children in that program, the Grace Living Centre, are leaving to go on to their next school uh, with a reading age well ahead of uh, what was expected. They're reading at grade three level and higher. And the reason, so they're vaulting over these standards and the reason is that they're getting a personalized education, that people are sitting listening to them, reading to them, and helping them one-on-one. -on -one. So they are exceeding expectations. 
The second thing, though, that's happening is they're learning much more than how to read because they're talking with each other along the way. You know that if you put the very young together with people who are you know, ahead of their cohort, <laughs> there's an almost mystical connection between the old and the young. They look into each other's eyes kind of across the ages. And so they're having a really important cultural conversation. Now, these young kids are saying to their the reading buddies, you know, who are in their 80s sometimes and into their 90s, um, you know, so what was it like when you were my age in Oklahoma, when you were four? You know, how big was your iPod? <laughs> and, and they say, well, we didn't really have iPods. You know, we had banjos, and, you know, <laughs> here is one of them. And so, <laughs> so they're getting this rich cultural education. The third thing that's happening is that the members of the retirement home are in the program, the Reading Buddies program, in almost every case, have stopped taking their medication. And the reason is that they have a reason to live. Literally, they're getting up in the morning energized and enthusiastic to face the day, rather than sitting there waiting for the inevitable and anesthetize themselves to get through the day. So they have literally got a new lease of life. They have fresh energy and a purpose, which is what they hoped would happen. But the final thing that also they've found over the five years of the program is that every now and then, they have to get the children together to tell them that one of the reading buddies won't be coming back again because they've passed on. And they have to understand that too at an early age, that there is a cycle here. Well, it's a very simple idea, but it's doing what you're saying. It's, it's simply reconnecting the generations. This is the way it was before we institutionalized our social programs before we invented schools and put people in age cohorts and kept them apart from each other, before we started to put our senior citizens in institutions because we had no way of caring for them in the way that we'd done for generations. When I was growing up, it was very rare for people to be put in an institution just because they were old. There was this, I, don't, I don't mean to idealize it, but human life is in the end cyclical and the best learning is intergenerational. And I think that when we do, as Mick says, divide people up by age group, we, we put artificial barriers between learning processes that for generations were natural to us. And then we wonder about the problems that we create as a consequence. And then we, deal, we create other programs to deal with the problems that we've created in the first place. And I think if we had a more holistic sense of, of intergenerational learning, we'd find a lot of the problems that we find intractable now would simply dissolve. Let's take a question from, from the audience. Um, the, the lady right at the back there in the green and black stripes. If you could um, just give your name and then your question and who, if it's aimed to a particular person or the panel in general. Um, my name's Lilla Hurst and um, I'll ask Ken this question first, but I'm very interested in, in everyone else's response as well. Um, it's just simply, have you not been tempted to lead by example and set up your own school because, you know, it wasn't, I guess it was around 100 years ago we had Montessori and Steiner. Um, you, maybe you think your sort of school does exist already, but I'm just, it's almost a desperate plea as well. <laughs> so, so Ken, are you ready to start a free school? I've started undressing, I hope that's it, but, uh, <laughs> as I'm staying. Uh, well, honestly, I, I think you have to, to um, well, the short answer is that I, I've been asked a lot about this, you know, and, and I don't feel the need to do it. There are great schools out there and wonderful people running them. There are great head teachers. not like the, what I'm talking about is a theory and it's never existed. There have always been wonderful schools, and some of them are state schools and some of them are independent schools, and some are Montessori schools and some are not Montessori schools. There are good Montessori and not so good Montessori. To me, the difference is like, it's like at the moment the government's uh, becoming excited about free schools. In America, the equivalent really are charter schools. And again, there are good ones and not good ones. It's not about structure, it's about good and bad, you know, about balanced and not balanced and things of that sort. Um, but yeah, I think in the end, as, as a person, you have to decide where your energies are best spent. And I, I think for a bunch of reasons, really, that my energies are probably not best spent on a single place at the moment. I, I find myself, for whatever reason, in a position to uh, act as a kind of megaphone 
for these things. And I get asked to do that a lot, and, and I do that probably best through writing and through meetings like this, and working with clusters of schools. I work a lot with school districts, like you know, saying with the whole state of Oklahoma and other ways. And I ran, you know, in a previous incarnation, national development projects uh, with the, the precursor to the QCA, with the National Curriculum Council, the Schools Council. So I've always worked in schools. Um, but again, it, you have to make your own choice about where your energy is best put. And I think mine is best put at the moment trying to help to ferment the movement uh, in the way I do currently, rather than, than be in a particular institution. Let's pick up another question. Um, is there any... This gentleman over here, please. And then we'll take one from over here. So actually, we'll do, we'll do two questions, and then we'll get answers so that we can get a number again. So somebody over here, put your hand up in just a second, and we'll get a microphone over to you. Hi, I'm uh, Robert Stevenson from Blastbeat Education. Uh, would the solution, just ask the panel, uh, be for creation of more programs whereby older, more experienced people can link with children in schools and break down the barrier between the workplace and the schools um, that exist at the moment? Is that the way forward? Certainly that's what Blastbeat is doing. And I'm wondering if that's the thing that will break the barrier that we need to break. Okay, so the question about workplace and school interconnectivity. Can we have another question over here and then we'll pass it to the panel? Uh, who had the microphone? The, the lady just here, please. Oh, sorry, the gentleman already has sorry. the microphone. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so Ken talked about the uh, IBM report on accelerating complex chaotic change. Uh, and what? indeed, the. What did I talk about? The accelerating complex chaotic change. Oh, gosh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't hear the you. IBM report. Yeah. And indeed, the IBM also re released an HR report which basically concludes that there's not enough leadership development happening. Yeah. So the twin uh, reports basically decide that um, developing creative leadership is the most ur urgent priority uh, globally for many business leaders and, and community leaders. Yeah. And um, what I'd like to talk about is creating a space for people to learn how to transform this accelerating complex chaotic change into innovations that deliver sustainable growth. In particular, we think that creating the sustainable growth and learning how to transform complex chaotic change into growth is essential for driving Britain forward, reducing unemployment, and creating a better future for ourselves. So to sum up, what do you think young people should learn, or what should a learning program have that would enable them to learn how to create solutions, but in particular, how to create solutions when facing such a great, chaotic, complex unknown? Thank you. Okay, we could also take the, uh, the question from the lady here and then we can wrap all those three up into one. Yes, make it. Sorry, did you want to ask a question? I yeah. thought you had your hand up. Please, please, go ahead, please ask, ask a question. Okay. Um, my name is Linda Hook. Uh, I work in a pupil referral unit. Um, and I was just wondering if you could sort of give me your opinions on behaviour management and um, obviously um, a lot of schools that um, I work in seem to think that it's our responsibility for the um, behaviour management of the children in their schools. So maybe you could give me some of your opinions on behaviour management. Thank you. So we have three questions here. We were talking about connectivity between the workplace and, and, and the schooling area and, and how they can interact with each other to improve learning. Is that the missing, uh, missing link? Um, a gentleman over here was talking about what kinds of skills do, do we need to look for in terms of creative leadership uh, development and we're talking about behaviour management uh, issues from the lady there. Who would like to go first, tackle one of them or all of them? Kerry, very brave. I'm, I'm happy to do that because I think they're interconnected. Yes. Um, and I think um, that the, the, the real difficulty we have is that education is pretend at the moment. It's, uh, it's what you do to prepare for some point you know, in the future. The future's not a real place. So education isn't actually that serious. We pretend a lot in education that we're doing something important. We tell kids a lot. It's really important. You've got to do this. But what we don't actually do is give young people the chance to work on something important and meaningful. So my sense of how you tackle complexity, there isn't a curriculum for complexity. The system's thinking there's all sorts of other stuff. But you actually learn to live in complexity. The world is complex. The world is messy. You learn to live in it. So if we can create better connections between schools and not just the workplace, but real life and real problems and real challenges, 
Then we start creating an education system that is about supporting young people to work on real, serious issues. And if we start doing that, then I think we start tackling some of our behaviour management issues, because quite a lot of our behaviour management issues are pretend issues. They're issues about us trying to get children and squeeze them into a box that we're telling them is good to them, as opposed to saying, what are the real challenges that we're facing? How do we enable people to, young people to have time to really work on this stuff? Education has only, it's, it's a recent phenomenon. It's the last 150 years we've been separating kids out and saying live in a separate little space. And a lot of good stuff has come out of that. We care for people, we care for young people, we realize that we have a responsibility to them. What we have to figure out how to do now is both care for young people, recognize the need to protect them, but also allow them to real con reconnect with the really serious challenges that they are facing, that the, we are facing. Looks at you then, Mick. Yeah, they are connected. Um, when you were little, did you ever do that address where you put my street, our town, this county, England, Europe, the world, the universe? <laughs> and it was just great, wasn't it? Because you just realised where you live. You were this little thing in this great big thing that we were trying to learn about. And I think, actually, that's not a bad list of things to learn about. The interesting thing is sometimes you can learn about aspects of the universe because they're more tangible, nearer to you, more accessible than some aspects of the world on which we live that are sort of on the other side out of the way, hard to come to terms with. And we've just got to make what we're trying to teach our youngsters accessible, make sense, matter to them. And probably most of all, we've got to teach them to um, chew over learning rather than simply swallow it. And one of the problems we've got at the minute is we've got a mentality that says in order to get you to um, prove that you know things, you've got to swallow as much as you can, and now and again we ask you to spit it out, we measure what you spit out, and that's, that's what we call qualifications. However much you can spit out, that's good. And so you've got a swallow and spit mentality rather than to chew on it. Young... <laughs> so you don't like the analogy. But what, what you want is youngsters who are talking about, wonder what it was like to be living at a certain point, and somebody else coming along with a complexity that says it wasn't as simple as they make out, you know, because this was happening. And that Dickens, he was an interesting author because he was a, quite a wealthy bloke writing about poor folks to try and get social change. And he was, was a clever, he wrote it in little bits so that people wanted to know the next little aspect. A bit like a soap opera these days. And when he went to Boston, they were queuing up to watch him come ashore because he was a celebrity of his time. And to talk to children about what celebrity is and get them to think about it so that they see jobs in a different way and what people do in a different way and the way in which people make a difference on the planet in a different way and how some people come to, to the top of a profession or the top of a job or have a big influence because they've got, as Ken was saying earlier, they're driven by it, driven to make a difference. And our youngsters get, get taken in behind the fence nowadays to learn about the world that's happening outside, but they can't see it because they're in. And one of the sadnesses of the Wolf Report, I think, which is actually a very, very interesting document, one of the sadnesses of it is it said work experience needn't happen until after youngsters are 16, because they all stay on at schooling or something like that until they're 18. I think, actually, they need to be learning about the world of work and what goes on outside from a very, very young age to get that fascination of why things matter, to go to Kerry, to make it authentic. We would have a lot less behaviour issues if we didn't bother so much about consequences and thought more about what we put in front of the behaviour to make it the sort of behaviour we'd like to see. I'll stop there. I, I, I don't have much to add to that, though of course I will. <laughs> um, but it is a, it's a good example to me of, of how you know, we generate a problem, then, for, then we worry about how we can deal with this problem that we've manufactured. You know, the, the, uh, the, the, one of the features of our current education system is that there is this sharp divide in people's minds between academic and vocational programs. And you know, academic work is thought to be uh, a higher calling altogether. Uh, and the, it, it was actually enshrined in the 1944 Education Act, where we had grammar schools and secondary modern schools, and the 11 plus decide who went to which one. And 
you know, the idea was if you ended up doing manual work or you did th stuff with your hands or your body, that this is a, a lesser form of human activity than, um, than doing academic work. It's a very interesting division, this, that you know, politicians get into a moral panic about academic standards because they, they think it means education in general. It, it means a certain type of activity. And yet at the same time, you know, the term academic in popular conversation is a mild form of abuse, isn't it? You, know, you can def defeat any argument by saying, well, it's purely academic. You know, to be an academic is thought to be to be out of touch with reality in some way, you know, to live in an ivory tower. And it's one of the cases we need for a more holistic approach. And it is simply the case that when kids get involved in practical projects, real world activities in school or outside schools, they become engaged very often in a different way. Uh, in America, there's a whole program called service learning, uh, where kids are involved in real projects in their communities. It's at, not just in America, by the way. They have service learning programs in the Middle East, which are bringing together kids from the Israeli and Palestinian communities. They have service learning activities in Northern Ireland. It's just, you know, as they say, it's, this isn't rocket science. You know, if you get kids practically engaged, if you get them using their creative abilities to solve problems, to create new opportunities, um, then a lot of the difficulties that arise from them feeling static and parked in, in institutions which they don't feel are relevant to their lives start to disappear. And I think, you know, I agree with both of the comments we've had. I think we should start that in early age and, and to recognize that life, whatever else it is, is not an academic exercise. And, it's not, and school isn't a rehearsal. You know, kids are living their lives right now and, and the more involved and engaged they can become, the better it will be for all of us. A couple more questions. Anybody from over this side? Uh, lady at the back, please. And the gentleman over there with the glasses, uh, blue shirt. Um, thank you for the talk this evening. It's been really interesting. And thanks for the responses so far. Um, I'm a teacher. And I've come tonight with three other teachers from my school because we're interested in what more we can be doing for kids for the 21st century, etc. Now, I'm kind of in a bit of a quandary at the moment because there's a part of me that thinks that what I need to do in my career in the next 10 years, 20, 30, 20 years, 30 years, etc., is <laughs> I need to ignore what the government says. And I need to work in a school where the leadership is so strong that it has a vision for what is good for the kids. And there's agreement amongst the staff. And, you know, there's a passion amongst the teachers for delivering what we think in our school is good for the kids. But then there's another part of me that thinks that, you know, maybe if I think that we need to ignore politicians, it's because I don't think we're listened to by politicians. So there's another part of me that thinks I would like it in an ideal world that, you know, in, ten year, in five years, ten years, that... Teachers like me could be having conversations with ministers for education. Now, I'm pleased that, Ken, you've said that you were speaking to ministers today, and I think you're a pretty good representative on behalf of those that work, work in education. But there's a part of me that's quite hungry for teachers like me and my colleagues here to be able to speak to ministers, because this is our job. This is what we get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go into school, to prepare, to, to teach kids. Because for a lot of us, it is a vocation, and, and we really enjoy it. And so I'm asking for advice. <laughs> um, and I just want you to say, should, should I just think politicians, whatever you know, party they're representing, are they always just going to kick this around, as people have said, like a football? And should I just sort of carry on regardless? Or... Is there a way, could you advise us as teachers maybe more effectively to be able to influence the, the, the government of the day? Thank, Thank you. you. Gentleman at the back. Um, Daniel from Creative Partnerships in Portsmouth. Um, I was interested, Sir Ken, you were talking about flow and children's passions and being in flow. And it made me think about a lot of young people I know when they're really in flow is computer games and Facebook and what your thoughts were in terms of how we can utilize computer games and things like Facebook to motivate children when they're in flow. OK, so two, two, two different and both interesting questions. Um, one, the, uh, the lady at the back there was asking about um, whether teachers go for it with her intuition, or is there a way in which teachers can properly engage 
uh, with the politicians that seem to be intent on guiding their future. Um, and the gentleman there is talking about using the kinds of technologies that are embedded in the everyday lives of many young people, like social media, uh, internet, and video games. Who would like to go first? You don't have to answer both of them, or you can answer some of them. OK. Um, I think we need to recognize that politicians have to get their ideas from somewhere. Um, they, don't, they don't just invent them. Although there are rather too many 18-year-old Oxbridge graduates in think tanks um, sharing their ideas at the moment. Um, so I think there's a, the, there's a lot to be said for actually carrying on the work you're doing, demonstrating the new ideas and the models, and then the politicians will come to you. If you get it right, if you do something that is so brilliant and so outstanding and really makes a difference, then actually you can attract you can attract power and influence and interest to you. So, so I think you can carry on doing that. Um, I think we should deal with these questions separately, actually. I think they're two quite, quite different arguments. Although I suppose the other argument around social networks might be one of the challenges, I think, to all of us here tonight, and actually to Sir Ken, is how we do seriously start a grassroots movement. How do we seriously take the conversation we have this evening and turn it into the lot of very small actions that, when added together, can make a revolution? And that really, I think, is, is a challenge that we need to face. I don't think that focusing just on the politicians and the ministers as the, as the only site of power is actually that productive. We can do it a different way, but we need to start taking small steps. Yes, let's, yes, let's stick to that, that, that bit, the, uh, the thread first before we go to video games and social media, about yeah. mobilising. Um, yeah. Again. Well, yes, Ken talked about politicians. You know the bit about having your appendix out. They get very close to education. They talk very seriously about whether we should do was it prosthetic phonics or whether we should do, you know, ver whatever it is, I don't know. You know, how we should do it, the detail of it becomes very, very important to them about education. They don't do the same in defence. They say where we should invade, but they don't sort of tell them where to put the tank and that. They're very, very different in, in different parts. And politicians want power, and they put their policies together to make power. And so we think they're very, very committed to one little bit that you hear them talking about, but they live a different world. And they're relatively ruthless, so the ones that stay in. And they, they do need people to make arguments, but they use the arguments in the way they want. I mean, I think it's quite odd at the minute, quite sort of paradoxical, that we're going to have a um, consultation on a new national curriculum at the same time that we're encouraging schools to become free schools or academies where one of the opportunities is that you won't have to do the national curriculum. <laughs> and th they don't seem to see that there's a paradox in that. That's, that's okay, that's what we do as politicians. So you've just got to understand there's a, a sort of bizarre world that carries on. Um, talking about mobilizing, I don't know whether you know, but every time that there's a, co a consultation on any aspect of policy, uh, there are about 1,200 responses from the population of England, from a, a, a school population. Uh, there are 3, 32,000 schools, and we get 1,200 resp people responding about whatever the question is. And so politicians typically aren't under a lot of pressure. Most of them start because people are nice with, we welcome the opportunity for this to be reviewed because it's been much needed, whatever it is. So that immediately goes on positive. And we sort of hint that there's a problem. We don't do what many people do, which is, no, we're not having it. You know, keep it. We're very, very lovely, very benign. And always we're looking over our shoulder because the politicians put things in the background that pull the strings to make us do what we want. In England, we use the inspection regime, the league table regime, public accountability as real pressure. So the, the head teacher at the back who was asking about what do I do, the professional versus the sort of pragmatic is absolutely touching the spot because it's a really, really de delicate position for people to be in. Um, and so I think that the big thing to do is get involved. I mean, I made that comment about the better baccalaureate and it really is important that people join in with things and say what's what. Many of you will come tonight, you'll feel better as you go. You feel really, uh, there are more people like me. We sat in a room and we feel good. And when we go out, we sort of say, if only there were more of us. If only there were. And the problem is we all talk to the ones who think like us. And the politicians talk very simply, often put in 
arguments as though they oppose one another when they don't. And they look decisive because they keep it simple. The argument Ken's put tonight is very complex, it takes a long while to think through, and is much less easy to grasp for people who don't want to grasp it. So that's the political one. Political. Political. That's the poli it sounds like Ken Dodd, doesn't it? <laughs> political one. We'll do the other one in a minute. Anyone want to add anything to the political one before we go to video games? Politics? I'll, I'll just comment on the, on the political thing first. Um, I, I do th think we have to, as Mick says, get engaged in this. The, the politics is not monolithic. And, and I don't mean to suggest you know, that there aren't uh, people of goodwill in politics. There are. The job is next to impossible, by the way, these days. Uh, and most politicians have a very small window where they can think differently before they get obsessed about the next election. Even our political systems were not devised any more than our schools were for these times. It just is a nuisance when people actually come into these positions who frankly don't know anything about it. Um, but Mick is right. It, 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 we do actually live in a democracy. We do vote for these people or we don't. And it's not just the ministers we can influence. It's our members of parliament. It's local politicians. And there is a political process here that's available to us that's not available in some countries. What happens, though, is that we all get tired of it and, and, and we get sceptical and then we don't bother using the opportunities that are there. And I think that we should. Um, it's something John Dewey said, you know, that every generation has to reinvent democracy. And we do. We need to reinvent it. The good news, by the way, if I can just put it in here, is that, um, that all around the world there are people having this conversation everywhere. This is not something that's just happening in London or in England. Uh, it, the same conversations uh, or similar conversations are happening in, across America. Uh, people there are very disgruntled in the school system. I mean, I speak to teachers groups all across America. Uh, they have an even worse situation in a way. They have this legislation called No Child Left Behind. I always think that politicians show a wonderful gift of irony when they come up with titles for legislation. I remember Margaret Thatcher, when she was Education Secretary, she had a framework for cutting local authorities that was called a framework for expansion. It's just a, it's a what, wonderful irony. Uh, no Child Left Behind in America is a program of standardized testing and a narrow curriculum, and it's leaving millions of children behind. Uh, but I can see that's not a very attractive name for legislation. You know, <laughs> millions of children left behind. You know. What's the plan, Mr. President? The plan is we're going to leave millions of children behind. OK, well, this is the perfect plan for it. But uh, there is a process there that people on the whole don't engage in. That makes sense that people complain about it without doing much about it. Uh, but there are opportunities here to get involved, and it's a, it's a genuinely global movement. I feel, I feel optimistic about this, that, that there are uh, communities ever are trying to make the change. People know this isn't right, and we have to do something about it. The people who don't know, sadly, are sometimes the people who are making the legislation. But to loop onto your question, we do have opportunities now we didn't have. We have these social media, we have the internet, we have every kind of way of being in touch with people and connecting. And the, you know, a revolution is needed. It doesn't have to mean that every school gets transformed simultaneously across the whole country. Uh, changing your school is a big step for the children that you're working with. And there are always been great schools within these systems. The trouble is they're often great despite the dominant culture, not because of it. And I think we have to get on and transform the, the work that we do, our classrooms, our schools, the people we work with. And cumulatively, that will affect the larger change. It's the Gandhi's thing, isn't it? It's about being the change you want to see in the world. And I think if you can go to bed of a night feeling you've done your best and done the right work and you've affected some children's lives in the right way, that's something to be proud about. And if we can make the whole thing add up to a movement, then that's you know, an ambition that we should aspire to. And it's a noble one, and I think we can do it. To, to uh, Kerry just, and uh, Just Mick to pick on um, Ken's thing for a minute. You know, this is going on all over the world. One of the things Michael Gove uh, talks about a lot is uh, they put these different arguments together. Most, it says things like, um, we want young people to achieve no matter what level of society they're from, what level of deprivation we want them to achieve. Who wouldn't agree with that? What follows that is that we have other countries doing better than us, for example, Singapore. Therefore, we need to learn facts. In Singapore, there's a document, if you want to look, published by the Ministry of Education called Teach Less, Learn More. 
They're desperately keen at the moment to be moving away from a regimented, stifling education system based on facts, moving towards a curriculum that offers youngsters a better experience. Not just a curriculum, a school experience. They talk about learning for the test of life, not for a life of tests. Singapore is working on a different compass from the one that we're working on, but we say we're trying to copy where Singapore was, not where it's trying to be. And what we have to do is pick holes in these politicians' arguments by really confronting what they say. Unfortunately, we often don't have time for the reasons the person at the back was talking about. We haven't answered her question very well either. And talking about time, we've got to wrap this part of it up fairly quickly, but I just want to touch on the video games and the social media question earlier, because I think that's a, 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 real, a real important one for the learners in our schooling system today. So who'd like to pick up the, uh, the baton uh, in regards to video games? I think, Kerry, you're looking likely. <laughs> um, I've been interested in games and social media and things like that for, for, for a very long time um, and have been looking. I've done stupid things like bring Roller Coaster Tycoon into classrooms and figure out how you can teach physics with it and uh, do things like bring social media into schools and I've had schools say, oh, you can't do that, kids are bullying each other, at which point I flagged that it might be the bullying that's the issue rather than the social media. Um, but what's become really visible to me is that we need to be really careful about what we pick up around um, games and social media. Two reasons. One of them is immersion isn't the same as, as learning. Reflection, critical thinking, having some arguments are also important. So the game side of it is very powerful, but it's one, it's one form of education, one form uh, uh, of learning. Um, and I had a second issue, and I've completely forgotten what it is, and I shall try to come back to that in a second. But in the meantime, I will hand it over to these two who may be slightly more informed on games and learning than I am at the moment. I think games are fascinating ways of learning some things, and other things are best learned other ways. I think the world of technology opens up all sorts of possibilities, uh, but we shouldn't forget the world of books. I think looking at a screen can be too much for a child when it could look at the world outside and look at things in reality rather than watching it through, uh, through a gauze. And we've just got to make sure these things do the jobs they can do, putting children in touch with other people all over the world in a way that's productive and useful. And uh, we should keep balancing all things. Kerry's remembered, remembered what, what she was, was going to say. <laughs> Which was, after all that time, looking at these sorts of... Um, we tend to mistake... We tend to think that it's the technology that makes mm. the difference, whereas actually, when we look at what is compelling and exciting about things like games, it's that they offer real challenge, real feedback, the opportunity to work with other people, the, oppor the opportunity to participate in a fantasy world, to occupy different identities. The same, you know, what's interesting about social media, you're able to talk to other people, you're able to engage with them, you're able to work together on different things. So what we need to be careful about is that we learn the lesson about what makes these things compelling, and we bring that into education, and what we don't do is simply think, well, the answer to everything is a 3D multiplayer role-playing game that will teach the entire curriculum. So we need to just be a bit careful about what we're bringing in. Well, I think that's um, we're going to have to bring the, the panel Q&A because we're just running slightly over um, to a close. But I'd like you to join me in thanking our panellists before handing the closing words to Sir Ken. So thank you very much. So it's... Uh, so Ken, if you would uh, like to leave us with the, uh, the closing uh, comments the closing before we go comments. into the evening, I'd be most grateful. Thank you. I, I want to... Is this on? I'm not speaking at the moment, so you don't know, do you? <laughs> is this on? Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, if you've got five minutes, I want to show you a short DVD. Richard, can we cue that up? Um, the, uh, one of the key things thoughts for me is, have the lights just gone down? Yeah. Thank God for that, I thought. Well, <laughs> 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 oh, that was a moment, wasn't it? <laughs> I was about to pass out. Um, one, of the, one of our problems, and it's been touched on uh, in various ways by the panel, is that our, our, edu our education systems are planned as linear processes. And the 
one of the problems is that life is not linear. Life is essentially organic and creative. We have the, uh, the capacity, which other species have less of, to create our lives because of this power of imagination. And um, there are lots of examples of it, uh, but I think it's a, critical, it's a critical thought for education that our children will create their own lives. I mean, how many of you are doing what you thought you would do when you were at school? I mean, you impose some structure on this to say when you come to write your CV, uh, but really it's, uh, it's a creative act to compose a CV in itself. Do you know the Blue Man Group? Uh, I've got to know the Blue Man Group latterly, uh, and they're fantastic people. And they just seem to me to be a great example of this, that when you empower people, that li our lives evolve in completely unexpected directions. They were a street theatre group in New York in the 80s. Uh, three of them, two were at school and one met almost accidentally with the other two. And as one of their projects, they had a plan, uh, and it was simply that uh, they would go into the streets of New York, they would wear bald wigs and, dress, and paint themselves blue. That was the plan. As I said, it wasn't a great investment proposition, frankly. You know, we're going to be bald and blue uh, and see what happens. Well, 25 years later, there are Blue Man productions in 12, countries around the, uh, 12 cities around the world. They employ hundreds of people. Uh, there are 60 Blue Men now. One of the advantages of being bald and blue is other people can do it too and you don't know the difference. Uh, so they've created this fantastic uh, series of events and entertainments around the world. And the story in itself is interesting, but the other thing about it is that they said they reached, well, they got married and had children, so they're three wives now, uh, Jen, Jen and Renee, who are wonderful too. Uh, they said they reached a point where they thought, well, now we've got children, where do we send them to school? Because they hadn't enjoyed their own experience at school very much, so they decided to create a school. And it's called the Blue School, it's in New York. Uh, uh, it's a small school at the moment. It's actually based a lot on the principles of Reggio Emilia, and uh, they're connected with an international network of schools. But they made a short film about it based on, and I, I've agreed to be on the advisory board, and I do a lot of work with them. Uh, but they made a short film about it, which I thought you'd like to see. It's five minutes. Have you got time for that? And uh, it just, I think, illustrates some of these issues, both in their own career and what they're trying to do with their school. And I think you'll see some resonances. So, Richard, could we just run the, as we say, roll the tape? group first started we weren't a business we weren't a company we weren't a show we were just a community of friends looking for something interesting to do um, all we had was a character and a few principles that we shared we talked about um, we had no idea what we were going to do uh, we just knew that we were going to explore these ideas using this character so one of the ideas was that we all could be creative we needed that idea because we had gone through our educational experience thinking maybe we weren't creative. And then we got together and said, well, maybe that's not true. What if that isn't true? It was a really important principle to start with, and it's influenced everything throughout our career, really. Being creative wasn't necessarily confined to if you could mold clay or paint on a canvas or write music, you know, that, that anything that you did, that, that, that in the business setting you could be creative. Anything you bring your own creativity to in any discipline uh, is an act of creativity. And I, I think one thing that that really led to is that there's no separation. There's a consciousness about the way you approach everything. Our story is proof that Sir Ken Robinson is right. If ordinary people find their element, extraordinary things can happen. And there's actually a piece in our show that's a little bit of a, uh, a metaphor for 
our journey to finding our element. Um, there's uh, one of the blue men uh, plays around with uh, making a painting, and he takes to it very quickly. The other blue man tries to follow the same path, and that doesn't quite work out for him as well. Um, he struggles for a little while, just like we've struggled to find our own element. Some people are lucky and uh, they want to be rocket scientists or cellists, and these are existing uh, media. And for us, uh, we wanted to be um, postmodern multimedia vaudevillians who create uh, instruments and explore pop culture uh, in a sort of shamanic primal atmosphere. Where does that job uh, exist? Uh, you know, because if, if we could have found it, we would have signed up for that. We're always jealous of people who find their calling easily. Things just spin into place for them, kind of like the blue men on the left. We're more like the blue men on the right. We were confused by what life was throwing at us. How would we combine all of our different interests together into one art form? At a certain point, you just need to take the lead. No matter how ugly it is or how unlikely it may seem, you've got to try to follow your creative instincts and not worry about what it looks like or how much money it's worth. One thing that drew us together initially, even before there was a blue man, is that, that we were in our own ways disappointed with our educational experience. And I, that's one reason why we wanted to start a school. We wanted to create the kind of school that we would have loved to have gone to. We wanted to make a school that either we wished we had gone to or that we fantasized would be the school for our children. And that's a school that had, uh, as Sir Ken Robinson talks so much about, emphasizes creativity as much as any other subject. Um, teaches kids a special way to treat one another, a, a, a socio-emotional learning, um, is, is, is a place where you don't lose your childlike exuberance, where you, where you have such a zest for learning, a love of life all the way through, not having it uh, educated out of you. On a kind of metaphorical level, uh, the traditional model of education is that children are freight cars and the school is a grain silo and it's just going to fill each kid up and then move them down the track. And we're interested in creating a launch pad where kids are the rockets and we're just there trying to find the fuse. We knew we wanted to create a school that uh, a big part of it was actually teaching kids how they think teaching them a level of self-awareness that we felt was missing from our educational experience. I think it involves having the entire brain just really alive and exhilarated and tingling with life force. And uh, that needs to be part of our educational model. I mean, that seems like a crazy revolutionary idea, but it really actually seems to us that it makes sense, it makes actual academic sense. You know, it seems like when we're all kids, at one time, like, everybody paints. But somehow we throw away that kind of inspiration in the moment, and we get rid of a bunch of other things, too. We tend to think that the part of ourselves that feels different should be hidden. I mean, covered up. And I think what the Blue Man message is, is that, you know, do not hide that, because that part of you is the key to, you know, one's individuality, but also like letting it out lets all this creativity out. You know, ex having the courage to expose that part of yourself. When we drum on the paint, the vibrant color is a, a way of expressing the vibrance that happens when you, when you let your outsider come out. Not quite. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know if you picked it up along the way, but uh, Chris Wink there at some point, he, he talks about you know, creating this life that they've had. Uh, he said, some people want to be rocket scientists or cellists. He said, we wanted to be postmodern multimedia vaudevillians who make instruments and explore pop culture in a shamanic primal atmosphere. <laughs> uh, where's that job? You know? <laughs> Well, they create that job, and actually the truth is that's what we all do. We create a life, and we live that life. We compose our lives, and we live in the composition. 
And sometimes it's a good one and sometimes not. But we always have the opportunity to recreate it and to do something different. It's what uh, Carl Jung meant, I think, when he said that, of all of us, I am not what has happened to me. I am what I choose to become. And as a human being, we're born with a creative power that gives us many choices. And we need to give our children access to those choices, and we need to make those choices for ourselves. And I think we'll find, if we choose well and wisely, that we'll become something more than we expected, and our children will become everything we'd like them to be. So thank you for coming. Thank you very much to Ken Robinson, Mick Waters, Kerry Facer. It's been a fabulous evening. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you have too.